Okay, here we go, y'all. Um, you know, I had the opportunity to sit with this gentleman, and I, I do interviews all the time. And there are very few people that um tap into a different part of myself and of humanity, tap into uh, everything that that makes me enjoy what I do for a living. This guy's story is so fascinating and it's so unbelievable. If he were not here in front of us, you wouldn't believe that it was possible. You wouldn't believe that, that every word that comes out of his mouth was truth. I knew when I sat down with him before I had to bring him back um, because there was so much to talk about. Let, let me go through his list of accolades before I properly introduce him. Number one, um, he's the highest decorated agent in DEA history. Uh, he was awarded the U.S. Attorney General Award for Heroism at the White House by the Attorney General himself. Um, he received the Federal Bar's Medal of Valor, and he also received the DEA Administrator's Award. Um, and these are just a few awards that we can name on this show before it gets a little too time consuming. Um, he's an author. He's a producer. He is a uh, former uh, DEA agent. Please welcome to the show, Hector Bereas. Hector, what's up, buddy? What's up? I'm glad to be here with you, Sean. Absolutely. You know, Hector, I, I, that intro was a little long, but I could have went on for 10 more minutes giving you an intro. Your story, your accomplishments, your journey, it is nothing short of fascinating and, and just incredible. I mean, I, I, I literally sat with you and I couldn't wait for this day that we could do it again. So welcome back. Thank you. Glad to be back with you, Sean. Absolutely. Okay, Hector, uh, for those who may not know you, you wrote a book um, chronicling your life entitled The Last Narc. Yes, I did. The Last Narc was um, taken correct. from your book and turned into a four-part documentary on Amazon. It highlighted uh, one of the many career milestones that you've had, which was solving the case of kidnapped and tortured DEA agent Kiki Camarena. Can you please, in a, in a quick synopsis, give us an overview of who Kiki Camarena was and just some of the things that you found out in investigating that case? Kiki Camarena was a very prolific, very good undercover DEA agent. He was a friend and colleague of mine. I worked with him in the uh, California area before he was transferred to uh, Guadalajara, Jalisco, Mexico. I worked with him when he was stationed in Fresno, California. He uh, was uh, transferred to Guadalajara to penetrate the big uh, couples of the Guadalajara cartel. And the targets were Ernesto Fonseca Carrillo, La Jefe de Jefes, Basso Bossos. Uh, Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo, Rafael Caro Quintero, and El Chapo and, the, and others. Um, he was there. While there, he was kidnapped, taken to the drug lords. He was kidnapped by the DEFS, Mexico's Directorate of Federal Security, which is like RCIA. They, they captured him in front of the... Um, leaving the uh, consulate officer in Guadalajara. He was taken, delivered to these drug lords. He was interrogated for two days, beaten to death while he was being interrogated. And uh, so that's all I knew when I was um, basically assigned to investigate his murder and says that, that these drug lords uh, had um, kidnapped him, tortured him, to death because supposedly they were upset because he had been instrumental in destroying uh, one of the uh, the largest marijuana plantation site in Buffalo, Chihuahua. That's what we thought 
happened to him, this is what I told happened to him before I was assigned to investigate his murder. Uh, as I recruited witnesses from Mexico that were there, percipient witnesses that knew what had happened, how they planned, who planned the kidnapping, how they picked him up, who interrogated him, who beat him, and how he died. In the course of the investigation, I found out that uh, BFS was very much involved, which is Mexico's, like I said, equivalent to our CIA. And I knew, I knew that uh, because I had worked in Mexico before I was assigned this case, that the DFS worked under the AG's control of our CIA. So that made me very curious. Well, in the course of investigating the case, I am told not by one, not by two, not by three, but by four witnesses that one of the interrogators was a CIA operative by the name of Ismael Felix Rodriguez. They told me that Felix Rodriguez, along with some of the capos or drug cartel guys, had uh, interviewed Camarena and that the CIA had a hand in Camarena's murder. As a matter of fact, the witnesses told me that because they had also attended pre abduction meetings, that it was the CIA that was prompting, it was Rodriguez that was prompting the drug lords to pick up our agent. I uh, reported all my findings to the, uh, to, to, the, to the top of the DEA, to Washington, D.C. They told me that I did not have the jurisdiction to investigate another federal agency, that I needed to stay focused on getting evidence on the Mexican couples that were involved. They told me that th to write everything on not official DEA reports involving the CIA, but to report everything in office memorandums, which I did. They told me that the Inspector General's office would, re would, would, would review my reports or my memorandums and that they had the jurisdiction to investigate criminality, transgressions, what have you, of other federal agencies. I believed them, but as time went by, I noticed that, or found out that no, there was no movement towards trying to arrest at least this one CIA operative that tortured Cameron and I interrogated him, is my Infinity Rodriguez. I started to complain. So when I started to complain that the uh, investigation was not moving forward by the Inspector General's office, that I was moving my investigation on the couples um, in Mexico, I, I, I had some arrested and some of them we eliminated, some of them we killed, some of them we arrested. But I was not seeing any movement against uh, Felix Rodriguez uh, on this side of the border. So as I complained, they took me off the case and they sent me to Washington and I was ordered to stop investigating the Camarena murder case, to leave it alone. And um, I was given uh, another assignment in Washington, D.C., which to me uh, was a total cover up. Uh, our government's involvement in the murder of Agent Kiki Camarena. Okay. Um, wow. You go into this case thinking that you're investigating high-level drug lords for the uh, kidnapping and torture of a fellow DEA agent, Kiki Camarena. You later find out that the drug lords were only one part of a bigger system that coordinated, planned, and executed this man's kidnapping. Within the room of Kiki Camarena being tortured, there was DFS, which you say were created and trained by our CIA, there was a CIA agent, there were local federal police, as well as the drug lords themselves in the room torturing this agent. Do I have that correct? Uh, that, that is correct. Uh, the, 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 the participation of Mexican government officials, uh, 
to the level of secretary of government, the, the highest ranking Mexican uh, government official involved was uh, Manuel Barre Diaz, who was then secretary of government uh, for, for uh, Mexico. And, uh, and uh, as secretary of government, it's very important to note that he basically oversaw the, the, the Mexican Federal Judicial Police, uh, he over, oversaw Mexico's DFS, he oversaw uh, the military. So this guy was like number like, three highest level officials within the Mexican government. So these people all planned it. The reason they, they, they I found out later, they, they went after Kiki was because there had been a uh, basically a, an agreement uh, between the CIA and the drug cartels that they were used, they were, the CIA was going to use the drug cartels smuggling routes to smuggle weapons south, weapons south to the Contras. And that the reason that this coalition had come together was because the CIA was wanting to fund a war in Nicaragua that was not uh, approved by U.S. Congress. U.S. Congress, under the uh, Bolton Amendment, basically ordered DIA, which is the, the defense agency of our country, the CIA, and our military to stay out of that conflict, that they were not going to fund the, the, the war in Nicaragua, meaning that they were not going to fund the Contras that were fighting against the communist regime of Daniel Ortega. So therefore, the, the CIA being denied, number one, funding of the Contras that were fighting against the, the communists in Nicaragua, and also denied that they should be involved militarily they decided to do it secretly. So what do they do? They become partners with drug cartels to get money to fund the war, number one. And number two, they also need the cartels' routes to be able to smuggle secretly weapons from the United States South into El Salvador and into Nicaragua to the countries that were fighting, uh, to, the, to the countries that were fighting against the communist regime in Nicaragua. They told me that they had to do this because the Russians, the Cubans, and the Venezuelans were funding the Daniel Ortega regime, and they needed to help the Contras win this war. That was not authorized by our Congress, so they did it secretly. That's where this whole thing started. Camarena, through his investigations, stumbled on a ranch uh, one of Caro Quintero's ranches, John, that was being used by the CIA to train Contras. It was a ranch in Veracruz. Kiki received information that tons of cocaine was being smuggled into this ranch. Kiki had no knowledge of Contras. He had no knowledge of CIA involvement. He had no knowledge of anything other than the fact that he had information that tons of cocaine were being smuggled through that ranch from South America and all, and then trampolined over to the U.S. and he was starting to look into that. When they found out, meaning they are government and the government, government of Mexico, they were all working together to basically fund the war in Nicaragua illegally and get all those weapons to the Contras over there. When they found out that Kiki was looking into that, they decided to bring him in, kidnap him, bring him in, interrogate him and find out what he knew because they had to keep this very secret okay our, our, our government at that juncture was already in trouble because it was revealed that they were providing uh, our, our nemesis the Iranians with missiles so they were already under investigation by Congress the administration was so now if this was leaked out that they were also getting drug money to support this war that had been denied by Congress they were going to be in real trouble so when Kiki, when they knew that Kiki had found out about this, this operation that had gone in Rancho Veracruz, and I'm talking our government, our CIA, and the Mexican government, when they found out that Kiki was looking into it, they said, we need to pick him up and see what he knows. Now, the plan was not to kill him. The plan was to bring him in and find out what he knew. That's why when they kidnapped him in front of the U.S. consulate at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, in plain daylight, when they when they when they kidnapped him after they, they they got him in the car, he was blindfolded. He was blindfolded because 
the orders were not to kill him. The orders were to bring him in, interrogate him, find out what he knew, and depending on what he knew and didn't know, they might turn him loose. Well, they didn't turn him loose. They ended up killing him. Okay, um, a couple of things stand out to me. First and foremost, you're put on this case. You're highly decorated at that time. Um, you're actually a rock star in the DEA. Yes. Were you ever supposed, right. looking back, do you believe you were ever supposed to solve this case? Or did they just say, you know what? We're sending in Hector, highly decorated, and he's going to meet a few stumbling blocks. And at least we could say and write in, on paper in our reports, hey, we sent in the best. He turned up nothing. And case closed. Well, I think they underestimated me. They thought that I basically was going to obey their orders, just concentrate on the Mexican drug lords, go after them, get them arrested, eliminate them, what have you. And that, that, that was a, 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 a show of force that we were not going to basically take uh, the drug lords killing an American agent. However, they thought that because I would be loyal to them, I was not ever going to come back and say, hey, what about the CIA guy? I was told to leave that alone, remember. But I couldn't leave it alone because I knew that the, the, the real intellectual authors came from here, not from Mexico. The intellectual authors of kidnapping and interrogating Camarena did not start with the Mexicans. I thought it started here. Okay. So basically, they underestimated me. They thought that because they would offer me promotions and uh, uh, good positions in Washington, that I would say, okay, boss, I'm, I'm, I'm being taken care of. I just look the other way. But promotions, money didn't mean anything to me. This man was my friend. This man was another Chicano. And I felt his death. He was like me. I thought I wouldn't want nobody to... To, to, to be assigned to my murder investigation and to say, oh, look the other way on this stuff and we'll promote you or what have you. Uh, that I, 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 they, that's where they deem me to be a non-team player. I wasn't a team player because I insisted, what's going on with this part of the investigation? They wanted to divide it. Leave that alone and you just do this. But I couldn't do that. That's where they underestimated me. Okay, so... They did believe you'd come in and you would find your way to these drug lords. They had faith in you. What they didn't yes. see was the fact that above being a DEA agent uh, and a quote unquote team player, you're a human being. You were out there on the front line. You were locking up the bad guys and you believed in the U.S. and everything that it stood for in terms of drug enforcement and law enforcement. And as you were stumbling, because I got to believe that they knew if you get your hands on these drug lords, naturally, you're going to find a link somewhere to DFS. From there, you're going to find a link to Mexican government. From there, you're going to find a leak to somebody in the CIA. Could they be that naive to think that you, somebody who comes from the streets, somebody who fought in wars, somebody who worked his way up through law enforcement, would be a team player and look the other way? That, that just seems almost unbelievable. Well, yes, they un they underestimated me. They thought that, you know, by offering me the comforts of promotions in Washington, the offers of becoming a, a country at the any foreign country that I chose, that because of that comfort, that award, that I would just leave it alone and look the other way. But the, 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 the thing was is that I am a street guy, and what I saw in the streets I didn't like. What I saw in the streets that I knew because I investigated um, – the, uh, the, the, the Danilo Blandone and Freeway Ricky Ross, I knew, I knew that the CIA was bringing in cocaine. 
I knew that that uh, through Danilo Blendon and Edward Menezes, two contra officials, they were supplying Freeway Ricky Ross with tons of cocaine, and that they were basically inundating the inner city, the Bloods and the Cribs, with cheap crack cocaine. So I had already uncovered that before I was assigned the Camarena case. And I was having trouble doing my job because coming from the streets, coming from the barrio, I grew up with little gangsters and stuff. I grew up with them. I knew them. I, I, that's why I was so good. And I felt their, the reasons, their, 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 their poverty. I felt I knew why they went into drug trafficking because they didn't have any ways to basically make, make, make a decent living because they came from drug addicted parents and so forth. They never went to college. They never even graduated from high school. They wanted the car too. They wanted the things too. I understood that. But yet when I find, and I was okay arresting them because they were doing wrong. Mm -hmm. But when I found out that the CIA was inundating and they were bringing in cocaine to our countries, I started doubting doing my job because of saying, I'm arresting this poor Mexican down here with 10 ounces of cocaine. They're giving him 15, 20 years in prison, making him a felon, ruining his life forever. And these guys are bringing in tons, 10 tons of cocaine and one plane load, and they're saying, leave it alone. I knew that, and I wasn't right with that. So I was already having problems with what is our government doing here. But I did not believe that they would go to the length of killing even an American agent to cover the criminality. That's what I, I struggled with. And I was, because I was a good investigator, that's why they assigned me to that case, because they wanted me. They had to show that somebody was going to pay for Camarena's uh, murder. And they were going to make the drug lords. Okay, the drug lords killed him. So Hector, go after the drug lords. Just, just go over there, go to Mexico, go investigate him, arrest those you can, and those that you, that, that, that you can't arrest, try to eliminate him, what have you. But we have to show a force that we're trying to do something to solve or to basically do away with those Mexicans, those cartel members that killed Kiki Camarena. But in the meanwhile, I found out that our government's involved too. But they tell me, no, leave that alone. Somebody else will investigate that. But I became suspicious when they say, don't write official DEA reports. Well, what was the it's official? The DEA 6s. There, there you go. Say that one more time. I'm sorry. I was ordered not to report anything having to do with DFS or CIA on DEA 6s, which are official DEA reports. I was told to write everything up on secret memorandums, if, which would if, be forwarded to our inspector general's office and that they would pick up the investigation of the CIA's involvement, involvement excuse me, in Camarena's murder. Now, hold, hold there for one second. And, and I'm only doing the stopping you here for our audience. DEA sixes, they cannot be destroyed as opposed to the memorandums that you were writing. Do I have that correct? That is correct. A DEA-6 has, has a recorded number on it. And those DEA-6s have to be made available to Congress if, if there's a congressional and, and, and the Congress asks to review those, those reports, those they have to submit to Congress. So, But when the government is doing something like a black operation or things they don't want Congress to find out about, they order you to write stuff on, on memorandums, which are in, in, inner office memorandums, that are top secret. So therefore, those Congress will never get a hold of. And that's how they were, they, 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 they asked me to report that. And they told me to report that, that information of the criminality, of their involvement, of the CIA's involvement, and not only Kiki's murder, but also bringing in drugs, that that stuff should be reported in memorandums. And, and, and only because they told me, because you're not going to investigate them. That's going to be the responsibility of the, OIG office, Office of Inspector Generals. Those memorandum sector will be forwarded to them for they for them to take action against these these these, these Rodriguez's, these, these officials of the CIA that are involved in bringing in uh, drugs and involved in Kiki's murder. I believed him. I believed him. I said fine. So I wrote um, all, all 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 those um, all that information on official memorandums. 
Now they say they can find them. And now they say that I never wrote them. But guess what? I have evidence that, that I did write them. I have evidence that they received them. And I can prove without a doubt that I wrote everything involving the CIA's involvement in drug trafficking and his murder in official uh, in official memorandums. And they received them. Now they can't find them. Nobody knows where they're at. Hector probably never wrote them. Not true. This is what they say now. You know, Hector, the last time we had an opportunity to sit down, one thing stood out to me uh, above all. It, it almost feels as though the drug lords, um, at that time, you mentioned Jefe, uh, De El Jefe, not, Jefe de Jefe, which, which is Ernesto um, Fonseca, yeah. um, Cara Quintero, Rafael, and, right. and Felix Gallardo. Those guys, they right. have Mexico on smash. They're billionaires. It, it, it's clear right. that they were used from almost the beginning because I can't see a motive. Maybe you can tell us. Why would they mess up a good thing. They had everybody in Mexico on payroll. They walked around as legitimate businesses, businessmen. They had businesses, they had money, uh, and they were untouchable. Can you find a reason that they would willingly participate in the, the, the interrogation, the capture, the torture unless they were being used by both governments, it seems. That, that, that is correct. Uh, at that juncture, uh, Manuel Paradios, who was Secretary of Government, who I mentioned before, he had already been uh, given the, the, the coronation. He was going to be Mexico's next president. He was going to be uh, basically the guy running the country. He was trying to look good and please the U.S. government. He didn't want the U.S. government to oppose him becoming the next president. So he, I believe, was trying to basically please the Americans, be in tight with, a, with, 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 the, with, a, with the, that, the administration at that juncture. So he, he, he basically says, okay, we'll help you transport the weapons uh, south into, into uh, Nicaragua using six circuit routes, routes used by the by the cartels. And also, we'll, we'll help you fund the war. Gee, we, we, you become partners with the cartels. They'll donate money. They'll, 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 they'll support the war. And there's congressional testimony that not only did the Guadalajara cartel, Carlos Quintero, Fonseca, Mariardo, as we noted, but also uh, uh, Pablo Escobar, they were contributing money also to the CIA to fund that war in Nicaragua. Remember, Sean, it costs billions to find a war. I mean, you don't do it with millions, billions. And this was the way that the CIA, meaning well, think about it. They felt that, that, that communism was our number one priority. We had to destroy communism, especially in South America. They felt they were doing the right thing. Okay, Congress is not doing the right thing. Congress, through the Bolin Amendment, is denying us fighting communism in, 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 in South America. So therefore, we'll figure out a way to do it. And they did. This is how they were funding the war. So they become partners with the cartels. The cartels are ordered by the Mexican government. You have to become partners with them. Open up your roots. Open up everything to the, to the CIA. It'll, and they'll take care of you, by the way, too. So it was a good arrangement. And you're right. The cartel members, they were already billionaires. They weren't millionaires. They were already billionaires. Fonseca, the jefe de jefe, owned banks in Mexico, restaurants, resorts, you name it. He owned them. Carlos Quintero, at, 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 at the young age of 29, 28 years old, was, was uh, head over uh, $500 million in a uh, bank in uh, Luxembourg. He had, his own, they had their own jets at their disposal. They, they, they had everything they wanted. Why would they go pick up Camarena if they didn't think it was all going to be fully protected? 
that it was all government uh, basically sanctioned, they wouldn't have taken the chance if they didn't know that the government, both governments, was going to protect them. That's what they said, okay, let's go pick him up. So they didn't trust just sending their, their own pistoleros, so they sent DFS to go pick him up with pistoleros, which are some of my witnesses that, that were there when Kiki got picked up. That's what the plan was, and this is why the cartel members took a chance. They said, why would they take a chance when they had everything they only took a chance because they felt that they were be, going to be protected, not just by the Mexican government, but also by the American government. They were pleasing the American um, government and the, the, the administration at the time. They're not dumb. Fonseca Carrillo used to make numerous trips to visit the president of Mexico and Los Pinos in Mexico City. He, I mean, that's why he was a jefe de jefes, because he had the highest government connections in Mexico. Does that answer yes, your, your it, it very much, because from the outside looking in, I don't see a reason why they would have uh, kidnapped a DEA agent and put a target on their back if they didn't think that they were fully protected from the word go. It, it, it's clear working alongside the U.S. government as well as the Mexican government because I don't, I, I can't find one reason for them to do this and mess up everything that they had going. So, so they were clearly the fall guys in the end. Uh, you, you keep mentioning the CIA and the U.S. government. Who was running the CIA at this time? Well, I, I, I was at that because I, I don't remember exactly if it was Woolsey or who, there were several, because this went on for a while. There were several, more than one CIA director at the time. I can't remember who it specifically it was, the, 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 the latter was. I know Woolsey was involved in the beginning of it. Uh, but you remember that the CIA was, was weaponized by the administration. It's the administration, Sean. We can blame the CIA. We can blame the DEA. We can blame uh, the FBI. Whoever we want to blame. They are basically ordered and are weaponized to do basically whatever the, the, the current administration wants them to do. Now, according to our constitution, the, 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 the gov these government agencies are not supposed to uh, basically take orders from uh, the administration. They're supposed to be independent investigative agencies that they'll investigate uh, basically equally uh, to anything. But for, for, for administrations to weaponize these agencies, to weaponize the IRS and say, go, go after Sean, or go after Hector, go after this, that is wrong. For them to weaponize the FBI to arrest certain people and, and, and basically look the other way on other people, that is, that is called weaponization. That is wrong. And we've seen this. And it's not just with this administration. It's been with the other, with the other administration, too. So, therefore, I'm not political here. They, they, they shouldn't do that. This is against our U.S. Constitution, our, 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 our checks and balances that the Constitution has. They're not supposed to do that, but yet they do. And so we have the CIA here getting money to fund a war that they think that needs to be fought against communism, against Congress. Congress didn't want to get involved in that war, Sean, because we just came out of Vietnam. We had just come out of Vietnam in the 75s. 75, 1975, 76. And the Congress did not, was not ready, and they didn't think the American people were ready to get involved in another major war now in South America. So they, the CIA and the, the DIA, defense um, agencies, intelligence agencies, they go to the, they, they go to Congress and, and they say, hey, we need, we need, we need funding. We need to fight the, 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 the Cubans and the, and the Venezuelans that are, that are, that are, that are funding the, the, the Nicaraguans down there. And Congress says, no, we're not going to fund it. We're not going to give you any money. And, for, and furthermore, we don't want you to send any military help over there or get involved militarily in Nicaragua. No, we're not going to be involved in that war. So what do they do? They can't, the administration now, can't, they, don't want, they, don't, they don't like Congress saying no to them. So they say, hey, CIA, find, find a way to fund this thing. So what do they do? They go to the cartels and they, they get the cartels to help them. And, uh, and, and, and the next thing you know, the cartels are providing um, our, 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 our military and, and our CIA with funding to fund the war 
And then, to make matters worse, they start using military planes to bring in cocaine. It's no secret. No secret that, 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 that it was the, the, the CIA pilots that were flying in the cocaine uh, in American planes. And it is no secret now that they were the ones that basically caused the cocaine epidemic in South Central Los Angeles. So and what a part of the government is saying, say no to drugs, but yet the other part of the government, feed all the drugs that you can. You let's get all the money we can. So then you, what do you have? A cocaine crack epidemic in South Central and, and, and all the other big cities of our country. Babies are being born crack addicted. Uh, people are dying by the hundreds of thousands because of a uh, cocaine uh, overdoses. And yet, nothing is going back to these guys. And they, they, to this day, uh, the guys that were supplying Freeway Ricky Ross with all the cocaine, they, they've never been arrested. Then you know Blandon and Edward Menezes, they're living in South America. They were never brought to justice. Yeah, they are. They arrested that black guy, Freeway Ricky Ross. Of course, he's black. We're going to put him in jail. They arrested Freeway Ricky Ross. Matter of fact, Ricky Ross told me that he got... He never worried about being ripped off. He never had to carry guns or have bodyguards, he said, because he didn't care that they ripped him off. You know why? Because it wasn't his drugs. He, they fronted him the cocaine. He never paid for it. He said, so if I got ripped off, Victor, I didn't care. I wasn't, I wasn't losing any money. I just go to, the, to, 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 to them and say, uh, to Blandon and them, and give me more cocaine. I got, I lost, I got ripped off 100 kilos. They, they, they would just give me more drugs. So I didn't have to go after anybody or cared about being ripped off. I just, if they ripped me off, I just gave them the dope. Because it wasn't, I wasn't, it wasn't my loss. It was that blatant. Again, if people did not hear this from your mouth, they simply would not believe it. They wouldn't believe it. Uh, I asked you earlier who was running the CIA at that time, because I know at some point, old man Bush was the director of that agency. Uh, Bush goes on and he becomes vice president to then Ronald Reagan, um, all at the same time that this is all going on. We know Ronald Reagan's wife, Nancy Reagan, was pushing the whole say no to drugs campaign. That is what her agenda was as the first lady. But meanwhile, the CIA director and vice president is literally using the cartels and using street guys right here in the U.S. of A, like Freeway Ricky Ross, to flood the streets with illegal drugs to fund a war in Nicaragua. It's it, This is literally insane. I, I can only imagine somebody like you who fought for this country, uh, who worked law enforcement for the better part of your life, who killed people in the name of justice, coming to learn just how deep this rabbit hole really went. How, how are you able to, number one, do your job and to make sense of your life? Because your life essentially was a lie. That is correct. And thank you for reminding me that, that you're right. Uh, old man Bush, George Bush, had been the director of the CIA. Old man Bush later became vice president, as we know, and later became president. When old man Bush was very, had a very, very close friendship and a very close relationship to the gentleman, the CIA operative that I mentioned, Ismael Félix Rodríguez. Who, who at that time, who at that fact, time, if I, I got it correctly, he went by Max Gomez on the streets. Oh, yeah, Félix Rodríguez used, used to use his undercover name in Mexico. His, his, so nobody would know who he really was, was Max Gomez. That's why it took me three years to finally identify who Max Gomez was, that it was Felix Rodriguez. But I might, I have to make this point, know that when Bush became president of the United States, he brought Rodriguez over and gave him an, an office at the executive building of the White House. This is the same guy that interrogated Camarena. I'm glad you reminded me of that. Good point, Sean. This is so hard to believe. Uh, and, and the corruption, it, it, it goes literally so high up into the White House. 
it, it is just hard to wrap my head around it. So I can almost, I, I, I can't even imagine what you must have been thinking in real time. Oh, no, I, 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 like I said, I had a hard time doing my job. I really did. When I found out that basically that our own government was bringing in tons of cocaine, that they were basically distributing in, 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 it, 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 it basically destroy blacks, Hispanics, and even white people. They destroy them with drugs. They didn't care. They want to use drugs? Okay, let's feed them the drugs. Let's get the money and put it to a door. They say it a good purpose. The national security of our country because we don't want communism in our backyard in South America. As a matter of fact, they told me that. They brought me in and they said, Hector, he says, don't you understand here that we're not bad guys? We do what we have to do for the security of, of our country, for the national security of our country. We don't need the communists in our backyard. So even though you look at us like we did something bad here, we did it for a major and bigger reason and cause. Okay? The national security of our country. Why are you opposing us, Hector? Be a team player. Understand that we do not work under constitutional law. We're not a law enforcement agency. We are an intelligence agency. And I told the gentleman that I was talking to at, at Washington, D.C., I understand, but you sound to me like the bank robbers I used to arrest, arrest when I was a city cop. They all had a reason why they were robbing banks, but you have a reason why you're doing what you're doing. They would tell me that their mother had cancer, didn't have money to pay their medical bills, so they went and robbed the bank. So you're telling me like a bank robber the reason why you became drug dealers. So... I still, I, I still can't basically, I said, accept it. still bothers me. But you're right. I don't like the communists being in my backyard. And you guys feel that you were doing the right thing. Because you're right. You do not work like I do under constitutional law. You don't arrest people. But yet, you hire sn snipers and pilots and do all kinds of destruction and stuff all over the world. But you're doing it, like you said, for our national security. Well, there you have it. That's what I was told. And then it said, please become a team player. Leave it alone. This is a, leave the investigation alone. It was for a good reason. Well, um, you touched on a name that I want to go back to. Oscar Danilo Blandon. Um, a Nicaraguan drug trafficker. How does he fit into this picture? Oscar Danilo Blandon was a highly placed Contra official. He, he was basically not, he didn't, he, of course, he was the one that provided the tons of cocaine to Freeway Rick Ross, as Freeway Rick Ross will tell, will, will tell us, and probably already told you because I know you interviewed him. He was getting the drugs from Danilo Blandon. Danilo Blandon was just getting the, 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 the drugs from the pilots, CIA pilots that were bringing it in. They had 13 stashes in the LA area. I know because I was, I was involved in raiding some of those stashes in the LA area. Danilo Blandon had a business to sell, a car dealership and so on and so forth here in the LA area. He, he like I said, he was a well-to-do Nicaraguan. He was the one that was supplying freeway Ricky Ross. Now, going back to Rodriguez, Ismael Felix Rodriguez, when I found out that Max Gomez, which, by the way, I, I'll, I'll, state it, I'll state it again, it took me three years to identify Max, who Max Gomez was that interrogated Kiki, that it was no other than Ismael Felix Rodriguez. Ismael Felix Rodriguez goes way back with, with, the, uh, with, with the CIA. He was involved in Watergate. Ismael Fides Rodriguez was involved in the Bay of Pigs. He's a Cuban guy. Ismael Fides Rodriguez was involved in capturing and killing um, the, uh, the Cuban guy. Uh, uh, Who's that? Che? That was killed in South America. Che? Che Guevara. He was involved in killing Che Guevara. As a matter of fact, Ismael Fides Rodriguez was the one that cut Che Guevara's hands off with a hacksaw after he had him 
shot to death. Because is uh, when 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 they, when, they, when, they, when they had the little battle where they captured Che Guevara, Che Guevara was wounded in the leg and lower stomach, not death wounds, not fatal wounds. They captured him alive. And Ismael Flores Rodriguez, while interrogating him, what was uh, he? he uh, from what I heard from one of the people that was there, because I investigated this, that Che Guevara spit in his face and says, "You're warm. Get out of here. I'm not going to talk to you." So Rodriguez ordered him shot from the neck down, and he told Teran, who was Sergeant Teran, shoot him from the neck down, so it'll appear that he was killed in battle. He walked out of the room, meaning Rodriguez walked out of the room, Teran shot him and killed Che Guevara. When he went out and told him, okay, he was dead, so then Rodriguez goes to a helicopter, gets a hacksaw, and walks in and cuts Che Guevara's hands off, which he sent to Washington as proof that Che Guevara had been killed, okay? Later in life, Carlos Rodriguez ends up attending School of the Americas, which is uh, where they trained for Vietnam, and it was interrogation and torture, and he becomes one of the leaders in Operation Phoenix in Vietnam, where they were interrogating and, and torturing Viet Cong prisoners. A lot of them died in the torture. They were using a lot of waterboarding. That's where waterboarding became, um, became fashionable. So he goes way back with the CIA. And what does the DFS do in, in, in Mexico when they pick up uh, enemies or basically criminals? They waterboard them. Okay. So, I mean, this, this, this guy goes way back with the CIA and is very, very, was very, very close to old man Bush. As I stated, when Bush became president, he gave him an office at the executive building of the White House, Miriam and Rodriguez. Rodriguez has never been arrested. He's living in Florida and doing well from what I hear to this day. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Uh, let, let, let me move this thing back to Mexico. And I'm just going to ask you a very basic question. Why is there so much corruption in Mexico? Mexico has always been corrupt. The cartels basically have paid off all levels of the Mexican government, the city, state, federal, all the way up to Los Pinos, which is the White House. The cartels, basically, their money puts in whatever president they, 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 they choose. They control the presidents that, that go in. And this is not just this administration. Past administrations, Sean, they they are billionaires. Okay, they arm their bodyguards with very sophisticated weaponry. They basically could take on the Mexican government, and I'll repeat, they can probably take on the Mexican uh, uh, military, the army, or whatever. They could never ever win a war against us. I mean, our SEALs and, and our, our, our military are the best in the world. We could wipe out the cartels in one week if we wanted to. But there hasn't been the will, I guess. Donald Trump wanted to do it. Donald Trump, after the assassination of the LeBron, the Mormons, the 19 people that were in a convoy going to a wedding, were intercepted by the Sinaloa cartel, and they were, they were, about 19 were killed. As a matter of fact, they burned to death three babies that were in a in an SUV in their baby chairs. They lit them up and burned them. Nothing ever became of that. The Mexican government never arrested the Sinaloa cartel members that committed those 19 murders, by the way. Donald Trump was very upset at that. And he told the president of Mexico, we need to go in and do war against these cartels. And what did the Mexican uh, uh, president say? Lopez Obrador retorted, no. We don't want a war. We're trying to not start a war over here. We're going to basically solve this drug problem, attack the cartels with abrazos, not balazos, meaning with hogs, not bullets. He used that paradigm, that comparison. No, we're not. And we don't want you sending any SEALs or any Green Berets or any military people into Mexico because you are going to be in violation of our sovereignty. So therefore, 
back off. And Donald Trump didn't go in. But as well armed as the cartels are, and they are very well armed because they are as well armed as Al Qaeda uh, and the Taliban uh, are. They have lost rockets, they have surface to ground missiles, M60 uh, machine guns, recorders, rifles, grenade launchers. They have it all. And believe me, they could wage war against the Mexican government. As a matter of fact, hold, hold on, I want you to stop for one second, because because I'm trying to get right. to the 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 root of this thing. It it, it, it didn't start like this, um, and, and I'm trying to understand: was it economics? Was it power? How does drug traffickers? infiltrate every level of the government, starting from local police uh, to government officials, right up to the president of Mexico. It, it is, and I, and, and I ask you, you know, very simply, how does that country get so corrupt from the very beginning? Is it just finances? Are, 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 are these officials just greedy? I got to believe that when, when police officers are sworn in, they come in wanting to fight crime. How do you turn these people? How did it begin, if, if, if you even know that answer? Well, I'm not sure because it's been going on for uh, at least 60 years that I know of. I don't know how it all started, but the government of Mexico does not pay their cops well. The police there are, 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 are treated like criminals, which most of them are criminals. So therefore, on a, on a policeman's salary in Mexico, you can't support a family. So you have to turn to bribery. You go to Mexico to, to this day. I go there all the time. And if you get run a stop sign, the, the, the traffic cops want to tell you, you can, we can take care of this here. You can give me $20 now. Or else I'll write to a ticket, and it's going to cost you sixty dollars uh, to, to, to pay uh, at the at government office down there. So they supplement their salaries by bribes from the lowest cop to the highest level officials in the Mexican government. They all live off of bribes um, to su supplement their salaries, and there it goes further up. And then you have the the, the prosecutors being paid twenty, thirty thousand dollars to look the other way on a murder. And then you have the cops that won't even investigate a murder because they're being greased. And it's all bribe money. They, they operate totally on corruption. And let me tell you, Mexico isn't the only country that's totally corrupt. We are very corrupt in this country, too. We have a lot of corruption in this country. And it's not just now. We've, we've been corrupt for years, too. And what are we talking about the Camarena murder case? That happened, what, 25, 30 years ago? There was corruption back there. Look at the corruption that was going on back there. So I, I'm not political, Sean. I'm not going to blame the Democrats. I'm not going to blame the Republicans. There's been corruption in both administrations. They've both been corrupt. Okay? And corruption is what destroys a country. The biggest priority of, of, of government should be to protect its citizens, Sean. That is what our government officials number one priority should be. But it can't be a priority when you have an open border letting all the drugs pour into this country. All the illegals come in over here, you know, dis destabilizing our, our country because this is going to happen. So we're not being protected by our government. And something's going to happen in this country. We need to get back to the basics of e e electing people in both parties that are really going to protect our citizens. This inf influx of, 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 of smuggling that's going on right now is incredible. We have an invasion going on to the southern Mexican border right now. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I couldn't disagree with you more. It, it, it's corrupt on both sides of the border. Uh, but as pertains to Mexico, it, it feels like there is no one who is not on the tape. There's no one who is not supplementing their income with cartel money. 
And if that's the case, how do you live in a country that is run secretly uh, by the cartels? It, 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 where does the law and order start and where does it end? It's just insane to me to think that uh, a country can be infiltrated, like literally an entire country can be infiltrated at the highest levels by illegal traffickers. Yeah, it, it's it's just bananas to me. Um, I, you know, where do we go from here? You know, I want I want to switch for a second. Uh, when 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 you participated in getting the the uh, the original cartel leaders arrested. And I'm talking about Carol Quintero, uh, Phyllis Gallardo, and, and Ernesto Fonseca. What became of their cartel and what happened afterwards? Because that leads me to kind of where you were going with the borders. How many cartels were left? How many sprang up? And who's in power today? In the old days, when I was... Uh with the DEA and at the time that Camarena was picked up, there was only one cartel in Mexico. It was the Guadalajara cartel run by uh, Fonseca. He was the boss of bosses. Yes, there were other bosses. There was uh, had Felix Gallardo who was basically running in a lot of the cocaine into Mexico. You had Carlos Quintero who was basically uh, growing, cultivating a lot, a lot of the marijuana that was coming here. Uh, and you had others, you know, that were running different parts of the cartels in different parts of the country. But there was only one cartel. And that old man ran it with an iron fist. Fonseca basically got them all together and he said, we're not going to interfere with the citizens of Mexico. I don't want to hear that you guys are picking up girls and raping them. I don't want to hear that you're just killing people down the street for no reason. If anybody's going to be murdered, we're going to have a little meeting here. If somebody falls, is not being blamed by the rules here, by the cartel rules, we'll bring him in and, and we'll decide who we're going to kill. And he ran it with an iron fist. He did. So they get involved in the kicky thing and they were brought in by the DFS and the Mexican government and put together with our government. And so we destroy them. We go after them and we destroy the Guadalajara cartel. So what happens, then you have other little cartels spring up. Then you had the Bell Cartel, and you had the Zeta Cartel, and you had the Nueva Generación Cartel, and um, you name it. There were 50, 20 cartels, all fighting with each other to, to be the number one cartel. But the Sinaloa Cartel was the one that won over because they were receiving the total protection of the Mexican government. They became the most powerful cartel. Then now we have another cartel, which is Jalisco Nueva Generación Cartel. Now understand, the current government right now, the government officials of this government, are protecting the Sinaloa Cartel. The former government, which was the PRI government, which are out of power now, they were protecting the Jalisco Nueva Generación Cartel. So government officials and politicians are involved with the cartels. So now what do you have? A war going on in Mexico between the Jalisco Nueva Generación cartel with the Sinaloa cartel. You have the Chapitos, which are uh, Chapo Guzman's sons, now being uh, protected by the Sinaloa cartel, being part of the Sinaloa cartel, fighting against the Jalisco Nueva Generación cartel, which is Mesa's cartel, and there's a war going on all the time to take control of all the trafficking in the country. But they're both doing very well. They're both making billions of dollars. And how are they doing it? By controlling the border. They're doing it by human trafficking. They're doing it by bringing in very dangerous drugs. And what is really bad for, for, for the United States is now the Chinese have come into the picture. Now you have the Chinese, the Yakuza, and the CCP, which is the Communist Chinese Party, working with our Mexican cartels. 
And it's the Chinese that have provided the precursor drugs that the Mexicans are using to basically manufacture fentanyl and methamphetamines, which are deadly drugs. One pill will kill. And a lot of the drugs are being laced with, and the cocaine is being laced now with fentanyl, which is to kill the drug. That is what's going on. We, between, in, in, between August 20, 2022 and August 20, uh, no, August 21 and August 22, we lost 216,000 Americans of drug overdoses. 70,000 Americans died last year of fentanyl overdoses alone. We have had more people die in one year, Sean, than people died in the Vietnam War, the Afghanistan War, and the Iraq War. That is insane. And nobody's saying anything about it. But the poor people in the ghettos are dying. You can't walk in downtown LA anymore without stepping over people that are, you know, passed out, drugged out. And a lot of our crime is being committed by people under the influence of drugs or people that are mentally ill because of the use of drugs. Nobody says that. What do we hear? Let's take away the guns. Let's take away the guns. Why don't they say, let's take away the cars too? More people die because of car accidents than die of gun, gun, accident, uh, gun violence. So therefore, if we're going to take away the guns from the citizens and blame the guns for the murders, then why don't we take away the cars and blame the cars for killing people? It's not the guns. It is not the cars, as we know. It is the uh, evil minds, the sick minds, the drug-induced minds that are causing all the death and criminalization that's going on in this country. People walking into schools and taking out kids like they did in Uvalde. These people are not normal. It's not the gun. We're not going to blame the AR-15 that took out the people. We're going to blame the guy that's pulling the trigger. And what do politicians say? Let's take away the guns. You know why? Because they want more control. And we should never have a one-party system. Every party wants to get in there and stay in power forever. This is why we need two parties to have the check and balances. You know, this is why America has been so great. But we need to stop weaponizing uh, our agencies, supporting one, 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 one party over the other party. We need to do away with it. That is serious criminal, criminal criminalization that we're basically supporting right now. And we have. And like I said, I'm not blaming one party. I'm not political here. We, we've, been, we've had corruption in both parties, and we need to clean all that swamp out, all those corrupt politicians. When we identify a politician that's not working for his constituents, that's not working for the citizens, get him out. Get him out. You know? But no, they leave him in there, and they become more powerful and more corrupt. And our lobbyists, well, what is that? That's all corruption. They go pay some uh, some guy to to to, to, to uh, vote in favor of whatever it is. That that should be permitted, but it's permitted in this country. You know, you touched on so many points um, that that we 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 have to dive a little deeper into. Uh, you spoke about the cartels now being in bed with the Chinese. Um, you specifically mentioned the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party. We, we know that the Chinese are supplying the cartels with the raw ingredients which are used to make fentanyl. But I also read that the, the Chinese are arming the, the uh, cartels. Do you know that to be any truth there? I have I have information that they have been arming the the cartels, and that other governments are also arming the cartels. It's only you know these guys will go to whoever will sell them the weapons, and the weapons that they're using are not, of course, we know weapons that you can buy at the neighborhood gun shop. These weapons are very sophisticated military weapons, and yes, yes, there is information that the Chinese Communist Party has provided weapons to the cartels. Why? It's a silent war. We have a war going on right now in this country. Like I said, we have an invasion of our southern borders. What, what else would the Chinese and the Russians have better than to destroy us from within? Fidel Castro said, 
when he was working with our cartel years ago. He said, we're going to destroy the United States and we don't have to fire one round to destroy them. Feed them. They're degenerates, feed them all the drugs. They will implode and destroy themselves. This is what people here got to realize. They are destroying us. We need to stop this. We're not going to have a country left. All these illegals that are coming in, that's that's going to be, that's going to destabilize this country, Sean. I don't care what they say. We do it because we're human. We're doing it for humanitarian reasons. Go to Mexico, see if they don't deport you. Go to Mexico illegally. My mom was deported from Mexico because she was a U.S. citizen living in Mexico. She was deported back to the United States, Sean. You can go to no country and just go in there and say, oh, I'm going to be here now. Give me a job. Give me a ticket because I want to go to wherever. And, and that's what's going on right now. This is going to cause major destabilization to this country. They're not thinking it through. I mean, what, what are we going to do with all these people? 10 million people supposedly have come in in the last two or three years. What are we doing with these people? Look at, look at, look at our parks. They're full of homeless now. You can't walk the streets of the inner cities like L.A. and in San Francisco because there's human secretion on the sidewalks as people use the sidewalk as, as a toilet. There's needles and everywhere. You got children got to walk through this stuff in our inner cities. We didn't see that 10 years ago, Sean. There was some of it, but not to the extent that we have it right now. We are decaying from within. Yeah, uh, you know, you... you mention uh, something very interesting. It's a silent war going on. We, we are literally being fed uh, these deadly substances for the U.S. to implode from within. And as we weaken, our enemies will then pounce on us, whether it be China, whether it be Russia, but the infrastructure of the U.S. is literally decaying by the day. So strategic, so well planned, and unfortunately, it's being executed seamlessly because we see that there, there is a drug problem that is only getting worse. To your point, more people have died in the last few years than several of this country's major wars. You know, it hurts my heart to think where this country's going and how weak we really have become. Uh, I want to stay in Mexico for one second. Um, you mentioned that the cartels, they have military grade weapons. Is this the reason that the Mexican government has not gone to full out war and eradicated these cartels? Are they just that outgunned over there? No, I, I don't believe that's the major reason. I, I really believe that the, the reason they don't go after them is because they get money from the cartels government officials like army generals and stuff like that in the Mexican government in high government positions are being paid. They're on the payola of the cartels. That's the main reason. Number two, if the Mexican government really wanted to take, to take, take these cartels out, they would seek the help, training, and assistance of the United States. We could go in there with, and, and uh, uh, as brothers uh, along with the Mexican army and we could take out the cartels in one week because the cartels, even though they have sophisticated weapons, they could never take on our army. They could never take on our seals. We are the, we are, we are the best military in the world. You know why? Because we have a lot of war experiences. We have a lot of war experience because we're always at war. That's why we're, we have the greatest and the most experienced military of the world. We could take out the cartels in a week. But the president of Mexico says, oh no, don't violate my, don't violate my, uh, my, my uh, sovereignty, whatever um, country here, don't come here, my sovereignty, you're gonna violate my sovereignty, why? He doesn't wanna take him out. 
They don't want to take him out, John. They can be taken out. Not only that, you want to stop the problems here in the country? All these guys that are that are that are the, the suppliers of meth, of fentanyl. Every time they somebody dies because one of these uh, pushers gave him the pill or sold him the pill, why not charge him with murder? That's a form of of, of, of a murder, uh, Sean. They should charge him with some serious stuff. Why people saying I ain't selling that stuff? They they or you know they put that guy in life or give him life prison. Really, really put him away. No. A little slap on the hand, and they, they do a couple, two, three years for drug trafficking, and they're out again doing trafficking again. We've got to get serious. It, why, why can't they? If somebody is proven to have sold something that somebody else ingested and died, you should charge him. They know those, those, those the drugs are dangerous. They know what they're selling is, 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 is very, very, very addictive and dangerous. But yet they still do because of greed. But you start charging some of these guys, with, with, with homicide and serious crimes and put him away for a long time, it will stop. But right now we're cradling criminals. Or, you know, a lot of them, I don't, I don't even, they don't even post bond anymore. They let him right, 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 right out to the streets again. Our government is not protecting its citizens. They're not fulfilling their responsibility. Their number one responsibility has got to be to protect its citizens. And yes, to protect the national security of this country. That's their number one uh, job. But they're not doing it. And they're not doing it because we see the open border. Think also of the collateral crimes because of the human trafficking. 85,000 children disappeared last year. They don't know where they went. Homeland Security doesn't know over 85,000 children that came in illegally. I know that the cartels are making money by organ harvesting, by making them sex slaves, selling them out to adoptions to people that can't can get, uh, get adoptions legally. They're making money in this country right now by doing all of that. Now they're, they have this new thing, it's called uh, andro, and, and, androgenophone. And that is, they use children's blood, supposedly, to bring youth to themselves. They're drinking, they're taking blood from children and they're, and they're drinking it. The cartels have got their hand in all of this, Sean. The women are being raped that are coming in. A lot of them are being made sex slaves in this country. That's what they don't talk about. The collateral damage of all this human trafficking. And think, why do the people that are coming in this country are wearing wristbands? A wristband basically proves that they've already paid to the cartels to come into this country. If anybody tries to come into this country through Mexico and they don't pay the cartels, if the cartels get them, they will kill them. That's why everybody, whether you come from China or you come from wherever you, from, I don't care, South America, whatever, the first thing you do when you get to Mexico, you want to come across, you go to the cartel. How much would you would you charge me? Chinese are I understand are are being charged twenty thousand per person to to be brought across illegally. South Americans between five and ten thousand dollars. And if you don't pay that money, Sean, to the cartels, guess what? You don't come across. You might try, but if, they, if you get caught, you'll be you'll be murdered. Let, let me make sure. I'm... And the cartels love. I, I want to make sure I'm understanding you correct. Are we talking about coming across the border illegally or legally? Illegally. Nobody comes across the border legally, illegally. So the people who... So if you're from China, you want to come to Mexico, the, right. if you're from China again and you want to come to Mexico, mm -hmm. the first thing you got to do when you get to Mexico is go tell the cartels and say, I'm here, I want to be basically assisted getting across. Um, how much do you charge me? Twenty thousand dollars. Then they put him. They give him a wristband, showing that they 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 paid their quota to come across illegally. Okay, and that's what's going. But, but on. there, but there are so these, these illegals are going to. Live. There are some people who are coming into the United States legally through the proper channels. Correct. Yeah, but it's taking them up to fifteen years. In other words, you're in Mexico and you apply legally. Right now, the, the, the process is it takes about 15 years for you to actually come in legally. Yes. 
That's why most people don't even bother applying for it legally because they get in front of the line. That's just what's the, the abuser. They get in front of the line. And this is why the people that apply legally take years to get in because we got 5 million people that, are, that came in in one year illegally. So we're inundated. Okay, so it's an invasion. You, you, you're speaking about points that um, affect all of us as United States citizens. In your opinion, why are the borders open to begin with? Uh, for, for some time, the borders were shut down because of COVID. Um, earlier this year, they were reopened. Why not just shut it down completely and build this wall and do away with all of the illegal uh, migrants, if you will, um, that are coming into this, or, or and I don't want to, the, the, the migrants I assume are legal, um, but all of the illegal border jumpers that are coming into this country. Now, that's a very hard question you just posed on me. The only reason that I think that the borders are remaining open and remain open to this day, even though the mayor of New York and everybody is complaining about we're being inundated, we can't handle all these illegals. The only reason that I can think of, and I don't know, is that somebody on this side is benefiting financially and is in cahoots with the cartels. Somebody. Why don't they shut it down? That's it. I wonder too, Sean. And I hope I'm wrong. I hope somebody on this side isn't being greased heavily by the cartel to keep it open. And I will again say, I don't know. But knowing corruption and heavy corruption, I have to highly suspect that somebody's getting money on this side. Yeah, I mean, um, the, 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 the border remains one of the, the top um, issues with all of the candidates who are running. We, we, we're we in a season where uh, everyone is, is running or campaigning to become the next president of the United States. Um, there was just a, a uh, debate um, between the, the Republican Party wannabes for next president. Th that, that's an issue that affects us all. And I really can't understand until we get our hand around this thing, until we can figure out how to get this country stabilized, why not just shut it down? I understand that, that immigrants help build this country, but it's so far beyond that. And we have tens of thousands of illegals coming into the country every day. You just mentioned 85,000 illegal children that entered into this country and they're never heard of again. This is a problem. It is. And I, and I don't care which side of the aisle that you sit on, whether you're Democrat, uh, Republican, independent. I, I, I think we all as human beings have to know this is a problem. And how do we wrap our hands around this thing? And if it takes shutting it down for a little while, I just don't understand why is that not the approach. So, and I would hate uh, to your point to think that somebody on this side of the border is in uh, partnership in any way with the cartels and is being greased. But I guess that would be naive thinking on my part to assume that it's not happening. You have to suspect that at least. You have to suspect that. Why I, I'm like you. What is it going to take to shut the border down? They all talk about it, but it doesn't get done. We have Democrats that are shouting, shut the border down. And we have Republicans saying it both. But it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. That is what, uh, what, 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 what worry, should worry us that this is continue to happen. And think about it. How many Taliban are coming through there? How many terrorists are coming through there? Forget the drug dealers. What about our enemies coming in through, through that porous uh, border? How many do we have in this country now? When are, they gonna, when are we going to start um, uh, suffering from, from people blowing people up over here? What do you call it? Suicide bombers and all that stuff. 
I worry about that kind of stuff. And I know they're coming in. They're coming in, Sean. Our enemies are coming in. And nobody seems to care. Yeah, they talk about it. You know, they, we should shut it down. Why don't you just shut it down? And I know a lot of citizens are, are, are basically tired of it. Yeah, I, it's, I'm tired it's of it. It's a problem that affects us all. It does. Um, and it seems to be no solution. A lot of talk, but no real solution. Um, and, and, you know, it's heartbreaking to think. That is correct. You know, right. I, I, the cartels, the, the cartels, the cartels are going to remain very powerful in Mexico until we declare them terrorist organizations. Because until Congress declares them terrorist organizations, we cannot go in. Once they become terrorist organizations and are declared so by our Congress, then we can go into Mexico and say, okay. Uh, president of Mexico, you don't want to cooperate with us. They are killing our people. We're going to come in, step aside, and we're going to go after them. And until we do, we have the laws and the means of doing this, Sean, but they don't do it. They just talk about it. We should declare the Mexican cartels. Just do it. Get into it and vote it in. Then we, 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 we very nicely go to the Mexican government and say, are you going to, are you going to be with us or against us? Because we're coming in. We're done. We've had it with all the illegals they're sending in, making billions. Think of the money they're making. Billions. and they're, they're so powerful. They, Jesus, they made over $50 billion last year. The cartels estimated they made over $50 billion. The cartels did. More than the U.S. budget, dude. More than our government. Okay? They brought in $50 billion. That's why they can buy anybody, not only in Mexico, in other countries too. But until we can go to Mexico and say, we're done, we've had it, you don't want to do anything about it, we hate to violate your sovereignty, but we're done. We're coming in and we're taking them out. Please join us. Please help us. Jump on our side, Mexican government. Let's go take them out. But that is another thing that's talked about and talked about, but it's not done. These, 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 these cartels, believe me, they instill fear in everybody. Every, they, they get their enemies, they, they decapitate them, they dismember them, they cut their fingers off, they castrate them, they burn them to death, and then they expose the bodies in parks and plazas so that the local populace and everybody can see. That's why they fear them so much. I want to get your thoughts, because if we've learned anything in this country, uh, looking at the Italian mafia, La Cosa Nostra. Vi violence in the streets, it's bad for business. It's not good for business. At the end of the day, these cartels, these traffickers, they're businessmen. Why are they so violent? They are violent because they need to have control. They need to basically instill fear in anybody that will oppose them, and especially their enemies, to include government officials. Government officials get killed in Mexico almost every day. Reporters in Mexico get killed on a daily basis. This is a way they instill fear. There's, you know, these, these, these guys are sociopaths. These guys have no feeling for, 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 for empathy for humans. El, El Chapo, for instance, he is he was a sociopath. He's the kind of guy that could be eating a hamburger with his left hand and cutting your neck off with his right hand. They're empty inside. They're sociopaths. They enjoy killing. And that's a real sick mind. When you have no sympathy for a human, when you can tie him up like they did Kiki and break his jaw, knock all of his teeth out. All right, pull his nails out, which they did, burn him and everything. They did all that to Kika Moreno. That is inhuman. That is not a normal human being. A normal human being cannot get another human being, tie him up, and then start cut, cutting his ears off, then decapitating him, knowing he's going to be decapitated, and then cut his limbs off. That's a very sick individual right there. 
But yet in Mexico, they glorify him. They make, they write songs about these guys. And they're hardcore, sick criminals, sociopaths, psychopaths, call them what you want. This is who they are. And we should not glamorize them in any way. Everybody in Mexico, the kids, they want to be Chapo Guzman's. They want to be Caro Quintero's. They make ballots of these guys. And these are very sick individuals. Very sick. And it continues to go on and on in Mexico, nonstop. People are getting picked up all the time. And they're being, like I said, tortured, dismembered, castrated, hung, burnt. That's going on right now. This is how they operate. And this is why they're so powerful. Like I said, if they grab somebody trying to come into that border that hasn't paid them off, they'll 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 pick him up and they'll 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 dismember him and throw his parts there so the other people trying to come in will see. This is what happens to you if you don't pay the cartel. So the, and we put up with it. I think we should have done it way years ago. We just go in there and take him out. So the violence in your it opinion. Let me tell you, it wouldn't take Go ahead, I'm sorry. Right, go, go, go ahead. ahead. I said we can take him out. It's just not done. It's just like, why is the border still open? Why haven't we declared him the cartels, uh, you know, terrorist organizations? Go in there and take him out. Why isn't it done? We need it done. And we did it done yesterday, not today. Look at all the people that are dying every day because of the overdose, this overdose. Uh, you know, I just find it so hard to believe. And, and I understand everything you're saying. Uh, the violence and and the levels at which they go to um, to showcase what they've done to human beings, to instill this fear, to make sure that everybody uh, remains under their control. I totally get it. I, I guess what I'm having a hard time with is it's always bad for business. It always keeps a spotlight shined on you if there are bodies dropping every day in the streets. And the fact that they are um, not just going after fellow traffickers, um, people who chose this lifestyle, it's reporters, it's law enforcement, it's government officials, it's politicians, and still nothing happens and they remain in control. I don't understand how the Mexican government hasn't, enough is enough. Even if we're outgunned, we're going to ask our allies to come and give us a hand. It's enough. Because this thing has clearly made its way into the life of regular, hardworking citizens of Mexico. And it's just shocking to me. Oh. It's shocking to us, Sean. It's, it's a very sad state of affairs. And like I said, there's no answers as to why. Why haven't we stopped? this invasion of our southern borders. Why? I don't know why. I can only suspect. Why hasn't Congress declared these very, very dangerous, heinous criminals, uh, uh, cartel members, uh, terrorist organizations, where well, we can go out and take them out? We can take them out. Our, our Believe me, our SEALs and our, 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 our Army Specialists, Green Berets, commander, com commandos we have, we can take him out in a week. It's just, oh, you're gonna violate our sovereignty. Don't come in here. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna fight him with hogs, not bullets. That's what the president of Mexico said. But yet, you know, he's very tight, by the way, with the Cubans, and he's very tight. He's got Cubans there. He's very, very, very close allegiances with the Venezuelans. You know, there's Russians in Mexico, and now the Chinese are in there. We have a problem on our southern borders. And we better pay attention to okay, it. Okay, so so I gotta ask. I mean, you know, history has shown the US has no problem uh going into foreign territory and eradicating perceived enemies. You can go back to Korea, you can go back to 
uh, Vietnam, Afghanistan, uh, Saudi Arabia. I understand its sovereignty with Mexico. I understand the relationship with Mexico. But there are millions of Americans dying, maybe not by bullets, but as you have so eloquently and uh, so directly stated throughout this conversation, we are being beaten from within. We are dying due to these pills, due to the drugs. Why hasn't America just said enough? We don't care if you no longer see us as an ally. We don't care if you won't allow us to cross the borders. But this is a problem that must be taken care of. And we are no longer going to sit idle and watch our people die, knowing that we have the means, the means to take these cartels out in a week. I don't know. There are, you know, obviously political complications because, of course, the the the, the, the Mexicans are, like I said, now becoming very, um, very close to the Chinese also. And the Russians, there are a lot of Russians and Chinese in Mexico as we speak. So, you know, uh, there is, I can't answer that, Sean. I really, deep inside my mind, I cannot rationalize why we just don't do it other than corruption. I can't, I can't, I can't imagine why we see thousands of Americans dying every year. And, and, you know, and it, it, maybe because it doesn't affect uh, the, the, the elites in this country. It, it affects more the, the poorer people that are dying of overdoses. It, it, like I said, the decay in our, in our barrios, the decays in our ghettos, and those people are dying. And nobody seems to care about it. They don't even, it's not even reported. It, you don't even hear it in the news. 70,000 Americans die a year and not nobody's talking about it? Something's wrong. Okay, so, so. Is it because. It, let, let me, let me ask you this. Uh, El Chapo, he clearly was a major force um, in Mexico. This, this is a man who, I, I, he probably doesn't know how many people he killed. Um, the last time you and I spoke, th this guy was the Grim Reaper himself. He, he led a crew called the Sleepers. They were known for killing right. uh, and burying bodies, period. That's what they did. Um, and this is before he even became the head of, or one of the heads of the Sinaloa cartel. But Mexico reached out and they allowed the U.S. to extradite him. And now El Chapo, who uh, escaped twice from Mexican prisons, has been put away for life on U.S. soil. Did the Mexicans give him up almost as a scapegoat? Because they could have kept him running around that country and continuing to do what it seems like every other trafficker is doing. In the case of El Chapo, El Chapo was never like a major, major drug lord. El Chapo wasn't that smart. Chapo had like a had like a third grade education. He is not a good businessman, what have you. He rose because of the reputation of being an executioner and a killer. That's why he rose in the organization. To give up El Chapo was easy for the Mexican government. They're giving up a really a person that was been made, you know, like something big, but he wasn't as big as he was made. The real jefe in the Sinaloa cartel is Ismael El Mayo Zambada. El Chapo was part of that, you know, uh, that cartel. He was just one of them. Okay, El Chapo was becoming an embarrassment to the government because he kept it, you know, basically he wouldn't stop. He loved the spotlight. He wanted movies made on him. 
He loved all the corridos. He loved. He was uh, an exposed. He liked being an exposed cartel guy. He wasn't quiet like a Meyer. You don't hear about no, Meyer no. Bob ever. He's very back back seat. It, he's hidden. Chapo was a circus clown. Put Chapo up front. He wants to be famous. Let him let him meet with Cato Castillo and all these movie stars and Sean Penn and stuff. He wants movies made on him. I mean, think about it. Think about this guy's intelligence. He is videotaped with Sean Penn saying he was the biggest distributor of heroin, of cocaine, of methamphetamine, of fentanyl in the world. What intelligence does that show you he has? On video. He was, like I said, he was a circus clown. He was a clown of the circus. He wasn't the owner of the circus. And they would, they, and, and those guys, the serious guys, love putting him up front. So finally they said, okay, you want El Chapo? Here you go, have El Chapo. And so just send him over here. El Chapo was never a jefe de jefes. He was just, he was known. He loved the, he was kind of like a John Gotti. He loved flashing, I'm the narco, make the song on me, I'm the bad guy. He loved it. And he exposed himself. He was an overt, basically, uh, drug dealer. An overt uh, leader of a, he was a leader of a, a, a cartel that was lower scale. Okay, but when when when, when did you see Mayo Zambada coming out and saying, make a movie on me. Send up Champagne over here to interview me. That shows you the intelligence and the insignificance of El Chapo. He was not a Caro Quintero. He was not a famous Gallardo. He's a guy saying, I'm the biggest drug lord. Make me famous. Make a movie on me. Write the songs on me. That's why he became an embarrassment to the cartel. And along with the Mexican government, you know what? Let's get rid of this guy already. This guy's ridiculous. I mean, going, you know, inviting Sean Penn and Kate Del Castillo and all these movie people to make a movie on him. That's what they're supposedly doing. That was the reason they chose to go down there. It's, it's ridiculous. They made him bigger than what he is, Sean. You see, most people don't realize that El Mayo is the true jefe de jefe when it comes to the Sinaloa cartel. Uh, we hear through American media that it begins and ends with El Chapo. And when El Chapo was extradited to the United States, the United States could beat its chest and say, hey, we got uh, the Bin Laden of traffickers. He's now on U.S. soil and we are going to do what we do best and bring this guy to justice. I, I, I didn't realize that for lack of a better way to put it, this guy's a figurehead. Um, he, he, he is someone that loved the spotlight but was not necessarily running, truly running the Sinaloa cartel. I, I don't think too many Americans realize that. The Americans, uh, a lot of don't know the cartels the way I knew them. I, my full-time job when I was the DA was to basically oppose the cartels. I knew the, the, who they were married to, uh, basically uh, how they slept, where they slept, what they ate. I knew everything about these guys. You know, they had so much money that when they wanted to impress a girl, they would say, where would you like to have dinner, sweetheart? They'd be in Mex you want to go fly to Mexico City from Sinaloa? They'd fly you over there and fly back. I mean, they had pilots at their disposal. They they owned banks, Sean. They owned restaurants. They owned car dealerships. Caro Quintero owned a, one of the major dealerships there in Guadalajara. Whenever he wanted to befriend a comandante, he would, he would bring him and say, pick a car. Pick any car you want on me. And I got an office for you over here. And here's so much money so you guys can basically open up your office. I know it. I've talked to commandantes that he did that for. He went and dined the government officials. That's how they, they, they bribed him and became friends with him. You know, they, they, they had one DFS commandante, Federico Castel del Oro, who told me that there was a, there was a trafficker that, 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 that was doing independent marijuana growing. And Cochiloco said, go, 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 go pick him up and bring him to me. So he said, uh, okay, so he's a commandante, so he goes and arrests the, the guy, and he brings him to Cochiloco. And uh, Cochiloco had a ranch there, and he had a backhoe, and he was digging, digging a ditch. He says, throw him in there. No, it wasn't one. It was four guys. Throw him in there. 
and he buried him alive. And from there, he got the name Cochi Loco, which means crazy pig. They, they do stuff like that. And they use the police to do that. When, 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 when they ask me, my own government says, can you perform a kidnapping? Can you do, I was called back to Washington, and the words they used were, can you conduct an extraterritorial rendition? This is the director of the DEA, and I said, what is that? Kind of laughed a little bit and says, can you do a kidnapping? And I said, yes, I can do a kidnapping. Of course, but I don't know what you're talking about, extraterritorial or whatever. I said, I'll just grab the guy and bring him over here. They were talking, you know, executive elite talk on the street time. When he said, can you kidnap a guy? Oh, is that what that means? Oh, yeah, I can kidnap a guy. And he asked me, how would you do it? I said, very simple. I need money. Give me money and I'll get commandantes that I work with down there that I know. And they'll pick him up and bring him to me. He said, you can do that. And I said, yes, of course they can do that. He says, how much money would it take? I said, depending on who do you want me to kidnap? You know, if you want me to kidnap the president of Mexico, that's going to be a little pricey. But it's depending on who you want me to kidnap. And they said, well, what would, what would it cost, let's say, to kidnap the doctor that injected drugs into Camarena when he was being tortured? I said, that guy? That's cheap. He wouldn't cost too much to kidnap him. He said, what are you talking about? I said, maybe $250,000. Is that U.S. dollars or is that, that pesos? Money? U.S. dollars, $250,000. Yep. Yeah. I said, yeah, but he said, and you can get him over here. And I said, don't bring him to me here in the United States. He said, do it. I said, okay. So I did it. It didn't take me three weeks. I got Dr. Machine kidnapped, picked up, brought and delivered to me here in the United States. Like I said, in Mexico, you can buy anything. And if the United States, if we want to pay the commandantes to kidnap, kill somebody, we can do it too. We don't do it. But like El Mayo Zambada and the major, the real serious, uh, the, 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 the executive drug lords, they don't kill anybody, Sean. They don't touch anybody. They have the chapos, those dormidos, and all the people that decapitate for them and do anything. They don't even watch. He just says, make sure that you do uh, this guy, tear him apart, throw his pieces in somewhere so everybody can see. But they don't do it themselves. They're not macho guys. They... Most of them probably don't even carry their, themselves guns. They have all these federales, militares, they call them military guys, federal guys, protecting them that will do their dirty work. Then they have a Chapo Guzman and the Dormidos who torture people and bury them and unbury them and do all that dirty work. You think they're going to they're gonna do that? They don't do that. They're billionaires. They run hotels. They own banks. They have businesses in Europe. They're flying all over the world. They have, their, their mistresses are all actresses and, 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 and singers and stuff. They have the most beautiful women. They live very luxurious lives. For instance, Fonseca would import all of the cloth for his tailor-made suits. A guy wore a suit even when he was in prison. He wore basically $1,000 loafers imported from Italy, silk socks, his perfumes, and colognes were from Europe. He didn't even buy American. They were like low class for him. He had a special cologne for him from Paris, France. He would inject uh, uh, stem cells. He would fly in doctors from Germany. That's why he's still alive. He would inject stem cells. That's how they lived. He had five wives that he married through the Catholic Church. He corrupted the Catholic Church too. And he had his wife in a mansion. He never slept in, in, in the same mansion every night. He would sleep with a different wife. As he got older, he became very cynical. And, and his, his workers would ask him, Boss, how do you stay up with all those beautiful young women? He says, at my age now, I just pat them in the butt. Somebody else rides them <laughs> like horses. <laughs> he was that cynical. But they were all beautiful young women. And he was getting older in his, in his, in his, in his uh, age. But that's the way those guys live. I mean... Come on, they're not going to get dirty and get some guy. The one that liked doing it because he is a psychopath. The one that enjoyed dismembering people was El Chapo. Look at his eyes. That guy's a total sociopath. Like I said, he was a, the, the, the clown of the circus. He wasn't running the circus. He was just put up front. I mean, think about it. 
And they made him here like, oh, we got a big guy. We got a big guy. And I'm thinking, Chapo is nobody. He's not a big guy. He's a dumb guy. No, the and U.S. Look at his interview with the Jean U.S. Peng. made it I'm seem. The biggest in the world. You yeah, know? The, the U.S. made it seem as though they yeah. had captured uh, the, the, the drug trafficker version of Osama bin Laden. This is how Chapo was presented to us. So hearing your take on right. him, it, you know, it, it's eye-opening at the least. I, you know, it, it's, it's I, I feel as though we've been lied to, you know, by, I mean, which wouldn't be the first time that we've been lied to by our government. But they hung him out there like this big fish and they paraded him around the states and they gave him this trial and they locked him up and threw away the key only for you to expose that even in his own country he was a clown. He he was the flashy drug dealer but he was not the boss. I guess overall I'm not surprised. Uh, you, you know what I do find interesting? No, no, be surprised. I, I find interesting because yes. are you familiar with that that channel Vice? Yes, I, I'm familiar with that channel. Okay, yes. I, I literally saw an episode. I don't know if you ever saw it, but they they went undercover um, and infiltrated the recruitment of Sicarios, um, the hitmen for these cartels. And what I found most interesting is that people are lining up to become Sicarios. They, they literally are, are, for lack of a better way to put it, I, I saw people who seem to be somewhat regular. And they would go into the jungle and they would almost apply for a job and, and want to become a Sicario for money. In your experience, is it that common that people just look at becoming a hitman no different than becoming a mailman in the United States? Uh, no, there are people, in my experience, and I was undercover into the cartels, and I, I had a lot of deals with cartel members and all of that because they didn't know I was a DEA agent. In my experience, okay, Yes, there was a lot of people that wanted to join um, the cartels and be recruited. They wanted to become hitmen. But the real serious cartel guys like El Mayo Zambada, he said, no. Why should I hire some nobody over here when I can hire snipers, military snipers trained by the U.S. government in Benin, for Benin, Georgia? to be my execution. Why well, wouldn't I hire some guy off the street? Most of the hitmen and, and the, 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 the Sicario that work for the cartels are ex-military and federal officials of the government of Mexico. A lot of them trained by our forces here in the United States. A lot of the guys, like the Zetas, that were military guys working for the cartel, they were they actually became the cartels by executioners, were all high-ranking military officers trained at Fort Benning, Georgia, by our Green Berets. These are the guys that the cartels recruit. They're not going to recruit some guy off the street and make him a Sicario. These are the real executioners. When the cartel guys are going to kill somebody, they're going to send these guys with badges, go and say, sir, you're under arrest. You're being, like Camarena, you're coming in with us. We're being under arrest. And they take him. And they dismember him and throw his body because he was a, he become an enemy of the cartel. That's what I know and how I know they operate. Why would you settle to to hire some guy that has no military experience, has nothing to offer you as a killer for you, when you can hire an expert sniper, an expert an expert in, in, in basic interrogation and, and murder, a cop? That's who their guys are. That's who the guys that are doing the hits are. They're all former cops or military guys. You you do realize, I know. You, you do be. realize the statement you're making right there. That that is a hell of a accusation. Um, 
in your experience, you have found that accusation to be truth that these guys are hiring ex-military trained by the U.S. And when we see these executions come across our screen, more times than not that these are military trained men that are just now on a payroll of these cartel uh, of the cartels. A hundred percent, Sean. A hundred percent. Do you think you're going to hire somebody off the street to use surface to air missiles, lost rockets, very sophisticated? I, I know those weapons. I'm a ex veteran of the U.S. Army. <laughs> you just you just don't learn how to fire a missile that uh, and blow down, uh, blow little pieces, a uh, helicopter or something out of the air. Because they hire people that know. How do you think they? <laughs> they operate this heavy artillery they, they're buying from the Chinese and, uh, and, and, other, and other weapons uh, merchants, military weapons. They have to have people that know how to use them. And the only people that know how to use them are military guys, a lot of them that were trained by us in the United States, by our Green Berets, by our SEALs are trained. We still train them here, and supposedly we train them to go against the cartels, but they get over to Mexico and they offer their services to the cartel. Think about it. If you're a mile somebody, you're going to hire somebody up the street that's applying to be a hitman. You're going to want to hire somebody that knows what he's doing. Somebody that can blow a, a, a helicopter out of the sky or even a jet out of the sky. Somebody that can blow a building up with a, with a lost rocket. That's what you're going to hire. Because some of these weapons these guys have are very sophisticated and nobody up the street knows how to use them. The only people, well, yeah, they do hire Vietnam veterans too. They've hired Vietnam veterans that, that know how to use those weapons. Who do you think trains them? And also these these merchants and the Chinese, whoever that are providing them with the weapons, they're training these guys. And these guys are not street people. These guys are military guys that are working for the cartels. So that program that you just mentioned, I mean, I never heard. I've never heard of them doing that that way. I've been with them. I've been with cartel guys drinking. And they say, you see that guy right there? He's a former captain of whatever Mexican army. You see that guy over there? He used to be a general now. Now he's working for the cartels. And they're even in uniform. They even wear uniform, Sean. They even had that scene, uh, the uh, cartel Jalisco Nueva Generacion. They had a parade showing off all their weaponry. It's a video. You can get it. And this, you see the, 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 the M60 machine guns on, on tripods, military cars. Uh, military trucks, I mean, full of cartel guys uh, with all the bulletproof vests, all the, all, all the military hardware on them, night vision goggles. They look like army. They look like, 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 they look like the, the Al-Qaeda soldiers or the Afghanistan guys. That's what they're up against. This is how big they become. They're not little anymore. You know, they're very, very powerful and very dangerous. That's how they control. Again, this rabbit hole goes so damn deep. Um, you you wouldn't believe it if, if it just weren't true. Uh, you said something earlier, and I should have picked up on it then. You said that you go to Mexico currently. I know at one point our government denied our government, your bosses at the time, denied that you were given the order to kidnap that doctor. Um, the doctor officially, eventually stands trial here in the U.S. The case is thrown out. He's sent back to Mexico, and the Mexican government takes out a warrant for your arrest for kidnapping. And you were left out there in the wind. Does that warrant not stand anymore? Uh, what happened, uh, the warrant uh, expired. It, the warrant was only good for 20 years. It, it expired in 2013. That's when the warrant expired. But yes, I was wanted in Mexico, and I couldn't go to Mexico at all. I had a warrant for my arrest. The Mexicans, Mexicans put my warrant in Interpol, meaning that I couldn't go into any other foreign countries. I couldn't go to Canada. 
because I wasn't in Interpol. They would, if I went to Canada, the Canadians would have to arrest me and turn me over to the Mexicans. So I couldn't leave the country for 20 years while that warrant was outstanding. Now, it, ex it has expired already. But yes, I was ordered to kidnap that doctor by the director of the DEA, Jack Lon, in front of two other uh, a, uh, uh, DEA employees, Doug Hill, and the uh, deputy director of the DEA. Uh, I forget his last name, but, I was, but anyway, he was there. I was ordered to kidnap the doctor. But to this day, Jack Lon says he never ordered it. I was thrown under the bus. So after the, I kidnapped the doctor and he appeared his initial appearance before a U.S. magistrate, it went, went world news that this doctor had been kidnapped by the DEA. When the DEA was approached, the, uh, the uh, press information officer, Frank Schultz, stated the kidnapping of the doctor was orchestrated by a rogue renegade agent, Hector Berreas, without headquarters knowledge nor authorization. That's why the Mexican government was quick to get an arrest warrant for my arrest. Jack Lund, the director of DEA, denied that he ordered me to do it and denies to this day, Sean, that he ordered me to kidnap that doctor. And that's a fact. Uh, so I gotta ask you, why, why do you think? Because because you have been very vocal, very out front, um, and very forthcoming with information that shines a terrible light on the U.S. government. Why weren't you extradited back? to Mexico. Why do you think they allowed you to stay here in the U.S. and just live out your days? Because I stayed quiet all the time that the war in Mexico was outstanding. I didn't come out and say anything because I was told when I retired, I was given my retirement and I was told, go enjoy your life, keep your mouth shut. You don't want to upset your own government because you might end up in a Mexican prison because you're wanted over there. And you know that in Mexico, you wouldn't last three days alive in a prison. You would be killed. So enjoy your retirement, keep your mouth shut, be a good soldier, and, and basically enjoy life. But I couldn't say anything while I had the warrant outstanding. I waited till it expired. An interview that I had with Megan Kelly was the first time that I involved CIA complicity in Camarena's murder in 2013. If you go back and check that interview. That was the first time. Her jaw dropped. She almost fell out of the chair when I said that the, the, the CIA was complicit in Camarena's murder. I, I think everybody's jaw dropped hearing your story, whether it's the first time or the fifth time. It, it, do we know our government is capable? Absolutely. But it is rare, if ever, that somebody like yourself, who was on the inside, who were part of so many special operations, can say conclusively, I have firsthand knowledge that our government turned on one of its citizens, one of its agents for that matter. You, you never see that and it is so hard to believe. Uh, to this day, do you walk in fear? Do, uh, are you afraid that one day you'll go to a restaurant? I mean, we see how Putin uh, tends to eliminate opponents of him and the government over in Russia. They'll, they'll ingest poison and just come down with, oh, it's COVID, but really it's something far more sinister. Do you worry that that's your fate? Because you are not only telling your story, but you're attaching your face to it. You're attaching your name. It's not like I'm speaking to you behind a veil 
and your voice is distorted. Do you worry about repercussion? You know, Sean, I've lived in fear most of my life. Yes, I live in fear. To me, fear is second nature anymore. When I was with DEA, I was in fear all the time. I actually thought that I might not get to retire, that I would be killed because I was being sent on all these operations in Central, South America, Mexico. I actually thought that I might not retire. Okay, so I lived in fear. And anybody that tells you that, that, that they're not afraid, I was scared. Excuse the expressing shitness a lot of times when I was in the cover that I was going to be exposed and be killed and dumped somewhere and never be found. Of course. And I live in fear now. You don't see me hanging out at no nightclub drinking at bars and stuff like that. I'm, I live a very careful life. I have very few friends. And I am always very, very cognizant of my surroundings. I don't frequent one restaurant a lot. So I'm always very careful. And do I live in fear? Yes, I live in fear. And I chose to expose this corruption because I love of humanity and love of my country. I love people, man. And I hate to see our government exploit our people. I hate to see our government provide drugs to our citizens and then arrest them for, 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 for using them or selling them. I hated that. I love the poor guy I grew up poor. I suffer their, 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 I suffer for them. I suffer their pain, Sean. And this is why if I die, then fine. But I'm going to expose the truth. We created a lot of these problems. Now, like they say, it, it, it's coming back on us. We have all these drug addicted people now. We have all this crime. Oh, why do we have all this crime? We, our government, has created a lot of these problems. We have ignored the poor. We have arrested the poor. Okay? I sympathize with a poor guy. I felt sorry for some of the people that I arrested. I grew up with these people at the barrio. I saw they came from uh, drug addicted parents. I knew a lot of them came from, um, you know, no father at home, one mother. The mother was on drugs, getting welfare. What kind of a future do you expect that poor Mexican guy to have? You expect him to, 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 to graduate from Harvard? Are you kidding me? That guy won't make it through high school. And they want to have a car. They want to have what everybody else had. But society never granted him the opportunity. So now he's a big criminal. Let's go put him in jail forever. We need to get the, the family back together. We need to get back to religion. We get get back to the basics here. Love thy neighbor. Take care of the neighbor. Don't arrest him because he's poor. Don't make him become a criminal. You think all these kids that are that are made all these crimes right now, they want to be that? They're hungry. They want to eat. They want to have what everybody else has. And I'm not excusing them. But I have to also blame our government for not taking care of them and creating this problem. That's why I'm, I expose all this stuff. I've stated it before in the, in the last interview I did. I liked a lot of the guys that I was having to arrest. I was undercover with them. I drank with them. I ran with them. And you know what? At the end, when I had to arrest them, I felt sorry for them. A lot of them even apologized to me because they liked me as a person. They liked me and they apologized to me and they said even they were sorry. And one day a criminal was telling me that in front of my supervisor. And I said, I told my supervisor, I feel sorry for the guy. Look, he's going to go away for 25 years at least. I feel sorry for him. He liked me. He said, no, Hector, he didn't like you. He liked Manuel Zaraga. You're an undercover a person. He doesn't like you. I said, that's hard to cope with. I said, I can't wrap that around my brain. He liked my undercover persona, but he doesn't like me. I think he still likes me. He doesn't know who I am, and he's apologizing to me. I don't, I don't think I agree with you. He says, no, he doesn't like you. He liked that undercover guy that you, you kicked it around with him, you drank with him and partied with him. You bought dope from him more than once, and now you arrest him, and now. I said, but I like the guy too. And I'll tell you, I like some of the guys that I arrested more than some of the guys that I worked with. 
And there is loyalty out in the streets. They protect each other down there. They got each other's back. In government, nobody had my back. Look at me. They threw me under the damn bus. What loyalty is that I have from my own government? They don't like me talking like I'm talking right now. But you know what? I live in fear. And if I have to die, at least I told my story. And there are other DEA guys like me, not just me. They won't say it publicly, but they got to like the people that they were undercover. Did you ever watch the movie Donnie yes, Brasco? Yes, sir. Yep. Uh, FBI. Well, Joe Pistone and I are friends. You know, Joe Pistone was fired from the FBI. He never got a retirement from the FBI. And he told me, I felt bad when I arrested all those mafia guys. I felt bad because you know what? Those guys took me in. They liked me. They took care of me. And yes, I was under covering to them for six years. And I knew at the end, they were all going to be arrested. And you know what, Hector? He says, I know you You agree with me because you were long term under cover too. We get to like some of these guys, didn't we? And I said, yes, we did. And I told him, I said, I like some of those guys. I arrested more than some of the people that I worked with. They, they had never had my back. They didn't take care of me. But those guys, a lot of them take care of each other in their criminality, in their in the, in the lives they live. And basically, I love humanity, and I hate to see our government, you know, not take care of its citizens. And I will repeat, government's first priority should be the protection of its citizens. Uh, before I let you go, I got a couple more questions for you. Uh, you speak okay. about government. What do you think about all that's going on with Trump and do you think he will ever return to the White House? You know, Trump is a very controversial person. Con Trump was not ever a politician. That's why they were able to insert Trojan horses into Trump's campaign. A lot of the people that, that, that Trump was told to basically assign as FBI directors or attorney generals. They were enemies of Trump's. They stuck in these Trojan horses. Comey was not a friend of a, a, a loyal or a, a friend of Trump's. He was an enemy of Trump. Ray is not an enemy of Trump. The attorney general is not an enemy of Trump. But a lot of these guys were appointed by Trump. That's what that's what people don't understand. He took the advice of the people, and they betrayed Trump. Excuse me, they betrayed Trump. Trump is not a political figure. Say what you will about him. He came in, he saw the corruption, he saw the swamp, and he tried to clean the swamp. So now they're after him. I don't know if he's going to make it, but they have set a very bad president. Are we now going to allow parties, political parties, to arrest their enemies just because they're enemies and protect criminality just because they're friends? And this is what we're seeing right now. Like Trump or not like Trump, this is bad what's going on right now. This should never happen in a civilized society. We're no better than Venezuela who Maduro got rid of, of his political opponent because he won the election and wanted to stay in power. Gardino, that one won the election and not even in Miami, exiled in Miami because Maduro was going to kill him. That was his political enemy. Okay? We're no better than, 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 than disturbed world countries now where they do that. The guy comes into power and he starts arresting all of his political enemies and killing them too. That's really bad. Right or right or wrong, this should not be happening in our country. And our country should not, our administrators should not weaponize government agencies to go against political enemies. That is very, very wrong. To use the IRS to go against somebody because they're not of their political affiliation. To target those people. Go after them. See what you can find in them. Arrest them. To use the FBI to go raid somebody's house. A political enemy. But yet other people are doing it, but you won't raid their houses. 
okay, to use to to to, to use uh, all the, the the CIA and all these intelligence agencies, agencies to cover up to cover up evidence because they're loyal to one political party. That is corruption, John, and that should not be happening in our country. If Trump is arrested, it's, he's only going to be arrested and convicted because they, the political party now does not want him to come into power. What's going to happen if the Republicans come in power and they start doing that, next they start arresting other Democrats? That is bad. I've never thought that our country would get to this point in its corruption. And this is all corruption. You know, I I find it very interesting, um, you know, because you you clearly, as you mentioned several times, this is not political for you. Um, you. You see things through a lens of right and wrong, and you see things through a lens of basic humanity, which I applaud you for. Um, I, I wonder what is your thoughts? Because I remember when Trump ran in 2015 um, for the 2016 election, he, he was very hard on uh, the citizens of Mexico. Uh, he ran on the, the, the promise that he was going to put up a border. Um, and it felt like he, he lumped all Mexicans, whether they were hardworking or whether they were traffickers, he lumped them all in one bowl. But there were still so many Latinos um, and Mexicans specific who voted for him. How do you make sense of that being a, a, a man from the barrio yourself um, with roots directly into Mexico and knowing what you know from both sides of, of your life, one of which you're just an ordinary citizen and another of which you have worked so hard um, on the side of law enforcement on behalf of this country and this government. I did not like those remarks by Trump when he said them. I don't believe that he meant to say that all Mexicans were criminals and rapists and whatever he said. I think he just misspoke. I think he was talking about a lot of these illegals that are coming in that are criminals. And a lot of them are coming in that were rapists and murderers or whatever. They were wanted for murder here, kill somebody here, go back to Mexico for a couple of years, then come back. A lot of them are. I believe that the Mexicans and Hispanics love Trump and voted for Trump because Trump is pro-religion. He is pro-family. There are a lot of things that Trump is for that Mexicans identify with. Mexicans are very pro-family and very pro-religion. They don't like all this stuff about uh, go undercover into the church and find out what the church is doing and and uh, they also respect education like Mexicans do. They don't like uh, uh, basically what they see is uh, arresting arresting parents because they're protesting against the school and stuff like that that's, that's gone on. So therefore a lot of Mexicans and a lot of Hispanics are going to support Trump in this next election. If he gets to be there if they don't destroy him and put him in jail where he can't run anymore, which is what the objective is now. They want to put him in jail right now, so he will not make it. They're trying to destroy him so that he doesn't become president. And I believe that the only reason they're doing it is because they fear Donald Trump. They're afraid of Donald Trump. I really believe that. That's the only reason that they, they, they put up, what, 90-some charges against, felony charges against him, or charges that everybody else has done before. Nobody ever would charge with those, those, those kind of charges. And the Mexican and Hispanic population can see that. They came from that type of dirt bowl country tactics where politicians killed each other. And they came from there. And you're seeing it here. They're running from that, this is Ma- these Mexicans and Hispanics, only to come and say, this is no better than where I came from. That's why they're going to, I believe, support Trump 
and the Trump that is not ruined or not kept from running by the opposition, he is going to have huge support from the Hispanics because of the religion, the family unity that 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 we need, that, that that he uh, basically um, projects, and uh, in education, and those are three big things, especially religion. You can be a criminal, you can be a Chapo Guzman, but man, he still believes in Virgin Mary uh, up here in Mexico. He still believes in in, 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 in the church. I, I walk around with killers, but they go to church every Sunday, but they'll go out and kill somebody. Seriously. That's one thing about, about, about Hispanic and Mexicans. They are true believers in God. How did I recruit the sicarios that, that were involved in Kiki's murder? I told you how I recruited them. I would get them on the phone and say, hey, I need you to come help me. And they said, but you know I was involved in Kiki's murder. I was there. And I said, I, I tell you, I won't arrest you. If you cooperate and become a witness over here, I won't arrest you. He would say, I don't trust you. You're going to arrest me. I was involved. And I would say, listen, do you believe in God? I'm talking to criminals. Yes. Well, if I swear to Jesus Christ that I'm not going to arrest you, would you come? I'm a Catholic. And I go to church every Sunday, and I believe in God, and I fear the Lord. And I'm telling you right now, if you come here, I swear on Jesus Christ's name, I will not arrest you. And they came. That's the only way that I could get a hardcore criminal to come here and cooperate with me, because they are very, very, very believers in, in, in the Lord and in religion. And all this stuff that they're seeing right now here, with all this anti-religion stuff and they hate that. And Donald Trump is pro-religion, and that's why I believe that the majority of Mexicans and Hispanics are going to be on Donald Trump's side come next election if he gets there. You know, that is such an eye-opening statement that you just made. Um, I'm an African-American male, and for the life of me, um, I, I never... I never could understand how um, a race of people could support, which from the outside looking in, with someone who spoke down on them, who lumped them into the same pile, who said things like, you know, there are rapists coming in and, you know, they are criminals. And, and you really just gave me a, a better understanding of Latinos and Mexicans in particular overall, because I, I really could not. And even as I asked you that question, I, 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 I've been trying to figure it out. So that's such great insight, um, one that I didn't have before this conversation. And I think that there are going to be so many people whose eyes are open, even um, as you spoke to how you were able to get criminals, um, people who protected those who um, kidnapped and participated in the kidnap, kidnapping and interrogation of Kiki Cameron, how you got them to come over and, and work alongside of you was something as simple as speaking to them for, on the level of, of religion in the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow, I mean, I, you know, I, such great insight right there. Um, by any chance, Hector, do you have your book nearby, The Last Narc? Yes, I do. This is a book that I wrote titled The Last Narc. The Last Narc documentary on Amazon right now uh, basically uh, was based on this book. This is my life story. It starts from how I grew up in the barrios of Mexico, how I got my education, my military background, how I'm a, a veteran of, of the war. And also it, uh, it, 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 it goes into the Camarena murder case, how I developed that case, and basically how I was. I was known as a shooting star of DEA that crashed. And I crashed because I would not sell my moral my morals for promotions or comfort. I had to tell the truth and stay with the truth. And this is what this book is about. Like I said, you can get it on paperback, in Amazon, on sale now. By any chance, are you on social media? Uh, yes, 
I well, I, I have I I don't have a program on social media yet, but yes, I do have a um, a website. Do, as do well. you mind sharing it with our audience? Because I know after this interview, there are going to be so many people who want to follow you or want to reach out to you, and I'm going to encourage everybody that that book, The Last Narc. It is if you think that this conversation is powerful, that book is beyond powerful. It's hard to manage. Uh, Cartel Madness on YouTube. Cartel Madness. They can, they can reach me there. Oh, right on, on YouTube. YouTube. Got you. Uh, Hector, uh, right. again, th this has been all my pleasure. Uh, I, I, I enjoyed last time that we had an opportunity to sit, and I really enjoyed taking that conversation and moving it forward. You are an amazing American. Uh, you're a man of principle, a man of morals. And I'm so happy that you're telling your story because you are what is lost in our society. Um, and more people need to look at yourself and your story and the bravery that it's taken for you to do what you're doing and hopefully model their daily lives after you. Um, I, I, I truly thank you, brother. I, I enjoyed our time, and, and I look forward to doing it again. Thank you. I'll, I'm here. Whenever you want to invite me back to your program, I will, I will gladly come back. I love your audience, and I want to thank them for staying with us throughout this interview. Absolutely. Everyone go out and get that book, The Last Narc. And if you want to watch an incredible four-part documentary, um, please head on over to, to Amazon and check out uh, The Last Narc. It, 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 it's deep and it breaks down the story of Kiki Camarena and also um, Hector's career. Hector, my brother, I thank you. Much love and continued blessings and respect. Love you and your audience. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much. What's up, guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love. Make every move a power move. And I'll catch you all on the next video.